Hi everybody and welcome to Dr. D's five minute lecture series. So today we're going to be talking about Anselm's ontological argument to prove God's existence. Okay, got my timer ready? Here we go. So Anselm, or St. Anselm as he's known, was a Benedictine monk who became the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, he lived from 1033 to 1109. And he's probably most famous for his ontological argument to prove God's existence. Now, first thing to know about an ontological argument is that in philosophical terms, it is what's known as an a priori argument. In other words, it is an argument that is going to be based on reason alone without uh, recourse to experience. Now, an argument that makes recourse to experience, of course, is known as an a posteriori argument, such as the uh, cosmological arguments that I talked about last time. Okay, so let's dive in. So, Anselm's ontolar ontological argument runs something like this. Number one, God exists in understanding, but not in reality. Two, existence in reality is greater than existence in the mind. Three, existence in reality is conceivable. Four, if God did exist in reality, then he would be greater than he is. This is from implications from 1 and 2. 5. It is conceivable that there is a being greater than God is. This is um, from 3 and 4. 6. It is conceivable that there is a being greater than the being than which nothing greater can be conceived. 7. This, however, is a contradiction. How can we conceive of a being greater than the being than which nothing greater can be conceived. Therefore, eight, it must be false that God exists in the understanding, but not in reality. So, this may seem somewhat bizarre to you, and probably for good reason. Um, the the idea that's going on behind Anselm's argument is basically that there's two ways things can exist, right? They can exist in your understanding or in your mind, or they can exist in reality. And the argument that Anselm would like to make here is that existence in reality, like really existing as opposed to just existing in your head, is actually an attribute um, which is greater than just existing in your head. So if we imagine that God is the greatest conceivable being, and he only exists, say, in your head, then we can actually imagine a being that's greater than God, which is an actual God that does exist. Uh, therefore, God must exist in reality and not just um, in your head. Okay, now I just want to talk about very briefly a later refinement by a philosopher named Norman Malcolm, uh, which attempts to defend Anselm's argument. And this, this might be a little bit easier to get a handle on. So first we'll start with Malcolm's step one. So step one, the concept of God is a concept of a being so great that none greater can be conceived. Two, a being whose non-existence is conceivable is not as great as a being whose non-existence is inconceivable. Three, therefore, the concept of God is the concept of a being whose non-existence is inconceivable. Four, if a being's non-existence is inconceivable, then the being exists. Number five, therefore, God exists. So what we see here is that a being whose non-existence is inconceivable is known as a necessary being. And this leads into another issue of what is the difference between a necessary being and a contingent being? 
Well, from philosophical terms, a contingent being is anything that is subject to uh, change, to process, to causality, um, is dependent on time and space, whereas a necessary being is uncaused and must exist. And so here we see a movement um, that's being made to argue in favor of a necessary being. And my time is up. So hopefully that gives you some, some toehold, some foothold into um, what the ontological argument is and what Anselm is trying to prove. So until next time, this is Dr. D signing off.